I've known Alan, is it Ger- Garber or Gerber? Garber, G-A-R-B-E-R. Yes, sir. I've known him for ages. We were both in the classic Van Halen, um, <laughs> classic Van Halen forum together. Yes, since about 2009 or 2010, something like that. It's, it's no longer there, is it? No, no. I, I think it might, might, there might be some archive of it somewhere, but yeah, it's not functioning anymore. Okay, cool. And, uh, and then Facebook came along, and here we are hanging out through the, uh, the power of the, uh, the computers and the webcams and the microphones and Zencaster. And um, we can just get stuck right into it. Dude, wh- what got you into Eddie Van Halen in the first place? Oh, yeah, that's a fun story. So, you know, I was eight years old in uh, 1979. Um, my uh, my uncle, my dad's brother, who was 23 at that time, uh, had gotten himself a, a nice guitar, <clears throat> a couple of amps, and he had an exquisite record collection. You know, a 23-year-old kid in, in 1979, that was, you know, he had every great record starting with, Hendrix going forward and he bought the first Van Halen album like right when it came out. Yeah. Um, and then and then Van Halen 2 had had come out and that was one of the uh one of the one of the last records that he bought he bought that. And on around the day or a couple of days after Tom Petty's uh Damn the Torpedoes album came out which was 79 he uh you know he he smoked a joint and drank some beers and uh with my dad listened to all of damn the torpedoes and he got in his uh 77 chocolate colored firebird trans am with the gold eagle on the front right Mm -hmm. and he drove that car and uh smacked into a brick wall about less than a mile from my dad's house (laughs) and he died oh no i don't think i ever told you this story but yeah so that that he died at 23 years old, man, you know, and he was, uh, you know, he was just good looking, long hair, you know, looked like, you know, like Matt Dillon in the old 70s movies and stuff, you know, what I mean, and, uh, you know, he had an incredible, incredible record collection. I mean, that guy had everything. And so, and he had a 1968 Fender Stratocaster with the maple cap, uh, blonde paint job, exactly like the one that Hendrix played at Woodstock. And that ended up being my first guitar. Wow. And, um, you know, so long story short, it was basically when I listened to Van Halen, because I listened to his records, I'd recorded them or he recorded them for me on a cassette. And, you know, I'd put on the headphones like we used to do back in those days, put on the first album and, um, you know, running with the devil got me. And then Eruption came on in my headphones and it knocked my world apart. And I just was like, I had to figure out how to do that. And yeah, this uh, was, yeah, this would have been ages ago. Yeah. So this is 79 and I was eight years old when I started. And, and of course, when I started, I had, there was nothing, I had a Mel Bay chord book that my uncle had left, you know, he played, he didn't play a whole lot. He didn't get a chance to really get into it. And, and, you know, the, the learning tools just weren't out there like we have, you know, yeah. Uh, and like the kids of our day have, but, um, I, I kind of slowly started listening to records and listening to all his records and, f- uh, figuring out how to tune to the records, which is a lot of, you know, that my whole thing about tuning, like I, I got really super into tuning and I've, I can listen to basically any record. And, you know, I thought that was just what you did. You know, I didn't know right. that it was unusual, you know, cause I never had it, you know, I didn't have a tuner and, um, come to find out that, you know, as 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 you as you know, I've done a lot of work on Eddie's uh, alternate tunings and all that kind of stuff. And but yeah, that that's basically the the story. I mean, you know, that right there just whipped me into a frenzy hearing that, and uh, and then I just started digging into everything. I got into my first bands when I was around eleven or twelve. I was eleven, and uh, that really kicked my ass. You know, playing with other musicians. Um, that were around my age and a couple that were a little bit older. Um, you know, I had my first band had, uh, what did we have? We had two drummers, three guitar players and no bass player. That's amazing. You got recordings (laughs) of that. Oh God, I wish we did. It was so horrible. And we, 
we played, uh, you know, we, we knew riffs, but we didn't mm. know whole songs. And we would just play the riffs from like Paranoid and Iron Man. And uh, we played You Really Got Me, but we, we couldn't play the B part. We could only play it the, a, the G to A. Oh, wow. Yeah, we, we were bad. I mean, we didn't know what we were doing. And, <laughs> yeah, I love that. you know, I mean, we were just starting out, you know, and this was in uh, a little place called San Marcos, Texas, in uh, central Texas, that's kind of between uh, Austin and San Antonio. And uh, I currently live in Houston, but I lived in San Marcos back then. And so that band was something else. It was three brothers, uh, two guitar player brothers and one drummer. And the drummer was really pretty advanced. He He was good. Those kids got me into Led Zeppelin, and I have a whole other affair with Led Zeppelin. Um, you know, that's that's kind of equal to or overcame Van Halen for me. Yeah. I mean, you think I like Van Halen, but I, I delved deep into into Led Zeppelin, so I've done a lot of work on that stuff. But you know, so we we started kind of learning those things and playing out a couple times, you know, and then getting you know getting you know like kids do back in the day. But in San Marcos, Texas, we were we were kind of lucky in a lot of ways we were in an area and at a time when um, there's kind of some local kids around here, the Sexton brothers, you may have heard of Charlie Sexton who plays with Bob Dylan and he plays with uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan's posthumous band, the archangels that happened after Stevie died. Yeah. And uh, so Charlie's little brother will let me and my friends open for him. And so Will and Charlie Sexton are sort of Austin legends and our stupid band got up at a great venue called the Cheatham Street Warehouse in San Marcos, Texas, where George Strait kind of got his start. And uh, George Strait lived in San Marcos as well. His daughter went to school with me. She gave me my first French kiss, but that's another story. <laughs> but uh, but th- that was like one of the highlights of our lives. We had no idea what we were doing. We got up and played our like four or five songs. I mean, I, I kid you not, we actually, we played Stairway to Heaven <laughs> badly. We played uh, Fade to Black. Uh, I'm not a big Metallica fan, but my friends were had just got the Metallica album, yeah. the Ride the Lightning album. And so they had me learn that. And I half-assed my way through that. And uh, we played uh, some riffs from Owner of a Lonely Heart and Paranoid, Iron Man, You Really Got Me. And that was like it. That was our set. And it was, we didn't even know, we would just look at each other and, you know, just be like, oh, we're going to change now. Okay. Oh, you know, I mean, man. terrible, terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, salad days, this is how kids are, you know. And I just kind of kept my nose to the grindstone and, you know, played around, uh, just, just worked, worked, worked and uh, started making some progress and, by the time I was 14, I, w- I kind of realized that I was one of these weirdos that wasn't like the other kids. You know, there was maybe two two other guys in my school that worked hard at playing guitar, uh, one of which was Kevin Dodds. Uh, Kevin Dodds is the guy that wrote the uh, Eddie Van Halen and, off- and Unauthorized Biography book, which you can get on Amazon. Cool. Um, Kevin and I were super Van Halen freaks. Uh, I had seen the band on the 5150 tour in Austin. Um, I mowed a lot of lawns and got scout tickets for me and my then girlfriend when I was 13 or 14. I just turned 14 and we got front row right in front of Eddie for $300 in 1986 money. That was a lot of lawns. And I did a telemarketing job, you know, to save up money to buy the scalp tickets. And back then you could get front row tickets for $150 each anywhere for any concert. Right. Brilliant. So, uh, met with Zeke Clark, Eddie's technician at the beginning of the show, he gave me one of Eddie's unused picks. And I have that later in the show. I caught a pick from Eddie and I caught two picks from Michael Anthony during that show. Nice. And he, he played, you know, the, like live without a net. He sat at the edge of the stage, literally like one foot away from my little 14 year old face. Oh, and, wow. you know, I was, I was, you know, I, I, you know, jaw dropped. Um, and if you can imagine back in 1986, I had recorded him on Letterman so many times and watched the, the 85 Letterman appearance where he plays Panama with the band. And I put on like, I had a uh, turquoise wife beater, black genie pants, the white Reeboks, and the 
uh, the bandana around my neck exactly like him. And I was already had my mullet going at that time. I mean, yeah, that, that's me a photos. Van Halen nerd, buddy. You got to send me photos. Yeah. <laughs> I wish there were a lot of photos, but I mean, it, I was the king of the world back then. I mean, I had, you know, that, you know, and I didn't even know it, you know, I had a, I had an actual like real girlfriend, you know, uh, back <laughs> then, you know, where it was like, you know, we're in, we're engaging in activities that we were way too young to be doing, <laughs> yeah. doing bad stuff, man, you know? And, um, but it was great. You know, my mom brought us to the gig and my mom had a cheap seat way in the back. So she let me and my girlfriend go all the way up in the front, just by ourselves. And, you know, my mom was way back there and, you know, I'll never, you know, my mom's done a lot of great things for me. And that, that was truly one of the great moments. Yeah. Um, you know, and then, uh, you know, I just kind of kept going and, um, as you know, it's kind of weird being in bands as you, as you grow up and, you know, people fall by the wayside. It's like Brian Adams, summer of 69. That's kind of the story. You know, people aren't really into it. They're not serious. They move on to other things. And, um, then even when you get people that are interested in playing, they're usually drunk or high or just, you can't depend on them. And, you know, it's like, uh, so I tumbled in and out of bands for a long time and it was just an exercise of frustration as it is. Yeah. You know, and I worked odd jobs and I, you know, um, but I always kind of tried to, you know, keep, keep the music going and kept working and working, working on, on guitar and, you know, got into transcribing music. And, yeah. you know, again, I don't know much about transcription. I don't have any music theory background, but, you know, basically for me to remember things, I would, I would just tab out things. And, um, you know, I realized I, you know, I used to kind of be down on myself about that, but then I realized, you know, tab is a tool. Um, that is useful, you know, because uh, as I discovered from transcribing Eddie's music, you know, where you play the note, even though there's many places you can play notes on the guitar's neck, it matters where you play them. Yeah. You know, and you know that from doing all your lessons and, and you know, you know that from playing the way you, you've been playing for so long. And, you know, um, so I just kind of, you know, kept going forward with that and just thinking that's that was what you did, you know, and um you know, so kind of that was, that's what I would do when I wasn't playing in bands. Um, by the, by the end of the late nineties, I had an acoustic folk duo with a really great charismatic, uh, lesbian singer who had a great following in the lesbian community here in Houston. Brilliant. And, um, you know, we, we were treated like gods whenever we would show up at open mics and just play wherever. And, you know, and it was like, you know, we just had a great time doing that. And then she went to jail for a while. <laughs> As just, you do. Yeah. You know, she, yeah, she was in jail for a while that cut our career short and, um, you know, but, uh, you know, I, I just, I never gave up on it. It, it, you know, you, this, as you know, this is something that you do when it doesn't make sense. You know, it, it, it's, it's from the outside, you know, people, you either get it or you don't get it. And it's like, you know, it, it, it doesn't make sense. It's not the best, smartest thing to do. Um, <laughs> You know, not, not from a money standpoint. No, not at all. You know, and it's like if you really are into it, it's going to cost you. It will cost you relationships. It'll cost you, you know, all kinds of stuff because it, you know, like Eddie, you know, you say you tell a story about the girlfriend that says, "Oh, you love your guitar more than you love me," and he'd be like, "Well, yeah, you're right." You know, mm -hmm. because when you're that dedicated and you're playing guitar as as I did and as I'm sure you did, you know, eight twelve hours a day when you're a teenager or in your twenties. Yeah. You know, it's hard for people to understand that. And like, and people are like, well, and even now my wife is like, you know, well, you're a guitar collector, you know, because you're not making money playing, you know, you're not making any money playing, you know? Right. But it's like, it, it's just one of those things you do even when, especially when it doesn't make sense. Yeah. You know, it, you know, it's, it's just a calling. And I, I know from knowing you, as long as I've known you that, you know, that's you too. You, you get it. Yeah. It's nonsensical. Yeah. It's not a grown up thing to do. It you know, it's like you just plunge yeah. headlong and you do it because you just love it. You can't not do it. Yeah. It's not an option to not do it, or at least in some capacity, you know? Yeah. I'm lucky. My wife is cool. She like if I need to buy a piece of gear, she's like, get the best piece of gear so you don't have to if it doesn't break down or you don't have to go back and buy another one later, just get the best one that they got. That is awesome. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, she is. She's lovely like that, which is um, yeah, which is great. And my wife is cool. I mean, in the sense, like, I stopped buying. I bought so much gear over the years that uh, I haven't really bought hardly anything since I met my wife. I already had about twenty guitars and some really great amps. You know, again, I started my very first guitar. 
you know, is this, you know, pretty darn valuable 68 Strat. And uh, I had a, uh, he, my uncle left me a 65 Blackface Super Reverb amp. Uh, and I have a little Sears Silvertone amp that that's wonderful. That's also, you know, fairly sought after at this point. Um, and, um, you know, just, I would collect gear back in the eighties when, you know, and that leads us into what you were, you were, uh, we were talking about and why part, part of why you wanted me on the show. Like I'd go to the pawn shops in the eighties and nobody gave a crap about, there was no vintage guitar, vintage effects, especially the effects. You could pick up the effects in the mid eighties for almost nothing at pawn shops. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I walked into a pawn shop one day when I was like a junior in high school and boom, this 19 and I've, I've checked the, uh, I've checked the pot codes on here. Uh, this is a 1974 vintage MXR phase 90 script logo, bud box went to a pawn shop. It didn't work. Uh, and I opened it up in the back and I saw that the only problem with it was that the nine volt, you know, the wire for the nine volt battery and the little battery cap thing had, had come loose. Right. And I, I didn't know enough about electronics, but I knew I could bring it to my guitar technician who'd been working on my guitar since I was a kid. I could bring it to him and he could fix it. Right. So yeah. I got this thing for $20 <laughs> in 1987. And you know that these things go now for like, you know, $800, $900 sometimes. Yeah. You know, so, <clears throat> but so I got this for 20 bucks. I paid my uh, technician 10 bucks to put a new battery cap on it. And it's been my go to thing ever since. And this thing is really super crucial to the sound of the the records, you know, where Eddie's using the MXR products. You know, these things, the vintage ones, are are much more subtle than the Dunlop reissues or the Dunlop EVH ones. And, you know, people argue with me that a lot. And I'm like, look, it, it's just a measurable fact. I've done a blind test with them, and I personally can hear them about, you know, I can tell the difference between this and reissues roughly 75% of the time. Right. I, look, right. I'll be honest. When I uh, when I first heard the album, it took me years and years. I had to read a magazine before I even knew that there was Phaser on on the on the guitar at times. And I was like, "What? Where?" And then I go back and listen to you know bits of uh, Eruption and just where, where there was Phaser on. And I go, "Oh, okay." It just yeah, it was pretty on that. What did he have that set on? Did he have it set in uh, different places? Yeah, no, it, it's it's only one setting, and um, for for the for the flanger and the MXR Phase ninety settings, we have some. You know, um, at the time when we first met on ClassicVanHalen dot com, uh, there wasn't any set canon on this yet. This was like people were guessing at the settings back then, right. but back in two thousand and fifteen or uh, March of two thousand sixteen, I think. Um, my friend, uh, Chris Gill, who, uh, co-wrote the eruption book with, uh, Brad Talinsky from guitar world. Uh, he, uh, did, uh, a interview with Eddie, uh, at the kind of the tail end of the last reunion tour and, uh, through Eddie and, um, Matt Brook and Tom Weber, um, Eddie for the first time revealed his exact settings for the phase 90 and the MXR flanger. And as it turned out, um, I was pretty right on with my guesses back, you know, many, many years ago. But and a lot of people kind of figured it out on it, they knew that he would used a slow sweep. And so what Eddie had said was he leaves it at about nine o'clock. So right about right there. I don't know if right. You can see that. So that's that's all it is for the phase 90. Now, uh, in that same article, he revealed the settings for the MXR flanger. And in the inter the old interviews with Eddie, he had said that he only used one setting. No one knew what that setting was at the time, right? Mm -hmm. People were guessing, but no one knew. Now, in that article that Chris did, Eddie revealed the exact setting, and the exact setting on the flanger is thus, which is essentially uh, around about 11 o'clock on all the knobs except the last one here, and that's the regen, regeneration or regen. That's full up. Yeah, right. So he yeah. used that setting on every single Van Halen recording that uses a flanger, period. Even when he went to the Dunlop EVH stuff and the reissues, he used this same setting. Um, when you hit, and this is this is all from the article that, you know, this was told to him by 
uh, by by uh, Tom Weber and Matt Bruck and kind of sanctioned by Eddie. It was okay with him to put this stuff out, and it was the end of the tour, right? Mm. So uh, there's the on the on the EVH uh, flangers. There's a button that says, um, I think EVH, right? Yes. That one reverts electronically. It reverts the flanger to this setting by just pressing a little preset button. Yeah. See. And so Eddie actually said he didn't use that button. He just went ahead and set the knobs the way he always set them. But you know, that, so that was kind of the trick with that. And then, you know, funny thing. And to go back to that story of when I was, you know, and this was like 1986, 87, when I went to the pawn shop, probably about a week later, I went back to the pawn shop and saw this there. (laughs) <laughs> so this was the most expensive one and it and I didn't have the money for it at the time and this is back when I was like I didn't I didn't have a job at that point and I was just like mowing lawns and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, this was $65 back in 1987 that I paid Brilliant. for this. Brilliant. So these vintage ones again, these ones are going for, you know, I've seen them go for over a thousand at some times, you know. But um and so I had these all the way since back then and um you know, I was just lucky to cash in on all that stuff. So I bought a ton of vintage effects that I still have to this day. I never sold any of them, you know, no matter what dire straits I got into, I never sold any of my gear that I bought, you know, and yeah, basically good. it was, you know, but if you were, if even today, if you're, if you sell your gear, you're not going to make as much money as you spent on buying it basically. Right. Yeah. And you know. I, I've got friends uh, like my friend Victor. He's always flipping guitars, and usually when I buy a guitar, it's kind of for life. Yeah, and you're obviously the same way. Yeah, I mean, I can't think of one that I ever. Um, I don't think I ever bought a guitar and sold it or, or flipped it ever. Yeah, you know, I basically would buy guitars that you know I try to get the best deal I could get. Usually they were in bad shape. I'd bring them to my guitar tech and he would set them up and I'd, you know, refret, spend, you know, a ton of money fixing them up, you know, and, you know, trick it. Like, for instance, this is my, and you know about this because I started talking about this back on classicvanhalen.com. This is my 1975 Ibanez Destroyer. Nice. And you might know the story if, if you recall many, you know, back uh, classicvanhalen.com days. I had started kind of researching, compiling what was out there on the internet and kind of, you know, talking with different people about the the destroyer. Um, and I ended up getting in touch with this photographer who had taken some really great black and white pictures of the destroyer. And back then on classic Van Halen, people were, you know, debating like, well, is it, is it white? Is it like a pearl white? Is it silver? Nobody knew. Yeah. Um, and there were these black and white pictures that, you know, made it look as if the guitar was white, but since they were black and white, you couldn't confirm it. And at the time there were no color pictures of the destroyer. Well, I got in touch with the, the, uh, photographer that had taken those black and white pictures. And this is about 2010 and lo and behold, he says, Hey, I've got something for you that will help solve your, your questions. I took a whole great roll of color photos that have never been published and never been developed from their show at the whiskey and I was directly in front of them. And this was like a a show in 1976. My God. And so those pictures, he developed them, um, sent me some thumbnails. I bought prints. I was the first person on the planet to actually see those pictures besides the photographer when he developed them. For some reason, he had this role of film that he never developed in 30 plus years. Jeez. So it... (sighs) So I posted those pictures back then uh, that I had bought prints of and it, and I didn't post the full pictures because I didn't want to screw the guy. You know, I was like, I didn't want to be like putting his images out, but I would crop them and say, Hey, and it proved that this guitar was white, just white, white, no uh, flip flop, you know, automotive color or anything like that. It's just plain white guitar. I added on my guitar. I added a, added a vintage Ibanez headstock logo in black. Where'd you get it? Uh, and of course, Eddie did not have any headstock logo on his, but you know, this is, you know, this is what it was. I went through some different pickups. Um, Eddie had a, uh, had a, had a uh, gold toned Ibanez bridge on his um, that he probably pulled off of a, a different Ibanez guitar that he may have had. So that's why this is gold and the rest is, you know, chrome. 
yeah. and then Eddie also used uh, strat strat knobs on this guitar. I wasn't sure what they were from the pictures until the guy actually showed me those that brand new set of color pictures, and yeah. that solved the mystery for me as well. Um, <clears throat> so it turns out that that actually the photographer had talked to Eddie about that. He said, "Well, what are those knobs and?" you know, are those strat knobs? I said, yeah, I just flipped, I just took these knobs off of this guitar and put them, you know, I took the strat knobs off of my strat and put them on this. And he explained to the photographer that he preferred having these kind of knurled strat knobs to do the volume swell thing. Right. So that was his reasoning for even putting these, uh, these kind of knobs on the guitar, you know, even though they weren't really functional, you know, it's only the, only the one pickup was ever hooked up. Right. You know, even in this, he didn't use the, the neck pickup. Yeah. You know, he just had it for the stutter effect on you really got me and all that stuff, as you well know. You know? Um, <clears throat> what's your favorite era of Ed? Uh, it's, uh, well, you know, it's fairly obvious. Like I am a little bit different than some others. Like I, I don't, I'm not like a hard and fast. I hate Sammy guy, mm. you know? So for me, I'm like, I love the club days all the way through the end of uh, the OU81 tour and OU812 tour in 1989. And that's okay. kind of where I draw the line. I completely lost interest after that. Yeah. So I'm not into the signature gear. You know, I felt I personally, I felt like his tone was horrible when he went to the signature gear and the, uh, the Soldano amps, and then later the signature PV amps, and then the later Fender signature stuff. You know, in 1989, he had used the Marshalls all the way through the, the OU812 album and tour. And then after that tour, around the time he was cooking up the uh, the F.U.C.K. album, that's when he got his first uh, Soldano SLO 100 amp. And that's yeah. when he started using the Ernie Ball signature guitars. So I'm with Eddie all the way through the Kramers and the Marshalls. And then that's it. Yeah. Personally, that's just where I, I lie. Now, my favorite era, obviously, I'm really, you know, a first partial to the first album, second album, Women and Children first. Obviously, Fair Warning is probably the band's masterpiece. It's their artistic zenith. Pretty much every guitar player agrees that that's the one. And, uh, you know, and the Diver Down really has some amazing gems in it, even though Eddie kind of slagged it for all the covers. Yeah. Some of the band's best original songs, I think, are on that record. Obviously, Secrets. Is yeah. one of the best things they ever did, um, you know, and that "Hang 'Em High," which was a rehash of the of an old song, probably the best iteration of that song in those riffs. I think is "Hang 'Em High" on the album. It's a great song. Yeah, um, you know, "Cathedral" is wonderful. "Little Guitars," the actual full band song, "Little Guitars," yeah. one of the best songs they ever ever did, in my opinion. Fantastic song. You know, so love that. Love 1984. You know, as we talked about and on. Uh, Classic Van Halen, um, people didn't really know that almost all of the uh, 1984 album was recorded with the Gibson Flying V, the 58V. Um, right. So I I liked it. And of course, this is part of my thing. You know, I'm really obsessed with all the the the, the little tiny details. And, you know, back uh, back in the day, I even was, I'd had arguments with people who were telling, because I, I put, did a post about how he used the 58 Flying V for Drop Dead Legs, and everybody kept saying, no, no, there's a whammy bar on the main riff, and I'm like, no, 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 there's not, you know. No, there isn't. And, you know, I posted a tab of how to actually play the riff and showed that the, you know, the entire main guitar on that track is the Flying V, and then he overdubbed with a whammy bar guitar of some sort, you yeah. know, possibly the Frankenstein, you know. Right. <clears throat> but, you know, so that, that, there's, that whole album is funny, so 1984, um, you know, really a lot of that now people are accepting that, you know, the, the, you know, it's like, it took 10 years for people to realize that, that I wasn't crazy, but yeah, almost the entire record was recorded with the flying V and here's a controversial thing. I am of the opinion that the jump solo was recorded with the flying V. Well, there's no, there's no whammy bar. Correct. And every other track on the album where there's no whammy bar except for Ripley, you know, or except for, uh, top Jimmy, right. You know, that's has no whammy bar, but that's the Ripley guitar. Yeah. Um, you know, it's got overdubbed whammy bar guitar on there, but you know, every song on there where he doesn't use the, the vibrato bar, it's the flying V. And so it just kind of goes to follow that he did that for jump. You know, why would he, you know, Eddie was a creature of habit. If the bar was there, he used it, you know? So it's like, you can, you can always tell, 
if he's using a stop tail guitar like the destroyer which he used on the first album and then the chris holmes destroyer which he borrowed and used on uh, women and children first you know though there's um you know there's stuff that we that we know like i know you've done a breakdown of uh, take your whiskey home yeah i was watching you do yours earlier and i, I liked all the stuff you did <laughs> So they're like, uh, that's, I don't even care about the first solo. It's kind of boring to me. He does the, uh, the over the hand, uh, you know, the uh, movable capo trick in the first right. solo. Right. So that's part of what, you know, it's first solo is cool. It's real greasy and kind of simple, yeah. but you know, it's very cool. Yeah. But um, the reason why I'm mentioning take your whiskey home and why the guitars are kind of important as to how things were played. Um, you know, you delve deep into a whole area of technique that I never did. I know you were, you got like a Paul Gilbert's video back in the day and you, you know, you started working on shred, you know, back yeah. way, you know, when I was a teenager, you and I were probably working on different things, but you know um, there's just certain things that are easier to do on this guitar with this giant cutaway up here. Yeah. Yeah. And so that spread lick, which is similar to the ice cream man lick is, you can't hear it because I'm unplugged, but. So licks like that, you can play this standing up easily with, right. with this giant cutaway. It's was so that, comfortable. What, was that what he was playing on? Um, uh, What was he playing on Women and Children first? So I do see. Well, a, so most of that photo, album was photos. the Chris Holmes Destroyer. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. So that's the deal. So take your whiskey home is one that's pretty easily identifiable as being the destroyer for two reasons. The ease that he does that spread lick and yeah. the other major identifier is that he does things like he does those yes. super wide bends, right? Yes. Yeah. He doesn't overbend on, uh, you know, the Frankenstein, you know, he, the overbends that you hear like on you really got me and running with the devil and take your whiskey home Fix uh, on fire. Yeah. That's he, you can, you, it's hard to physically bend like that and stay in tune on the, the Fender Tremolo Frankenstein, but you'll see that when he engages in those ridiculous wide bends, it's almost always going to be the destroyer uh, or the flying via stop tail guitar. Right. Yeah. Right. So yeah. that's, you know, that was part of my ethic when I was learning things, you know, was like, and this is why I got into getting a bunch of guitars. And uh, I was like, I need to get the guitar that's closest to what was used on the record to really dig into how the guy was playing it. Yeah. Makes sense. You know? And so that, that's why I ended up, I've got, like I said, I've got about 20 guitars now, you know, I got a lot of Led Zeppelin themed guitars. Um, and, you know, essentially like Eddie had stop tail guitars. I have a 58 um, Gibson flying V reissue that I got way back. Even, you know, when I put that together in about 2012, Nice. And um, I had, um, you know, started working on things like Hot for Teacher. As soon as I got it, first thing I did was play Hot for Teacher. Started working on Girl Gone Bad. Girl Gone Bad is just a one, you know, as far as I can tell, it's a one track live thing, all flying V all the way through it, just bass, drums, and guitar. You know, that's one of their finest moments. Closest that they ever got to Led yeah. Zeppelin was that song, you know, yeah. as far as I can say. Um but yeah, so that was another thing that kind of led me getting into the into the gear. And, uh, you know, when I transcribed the the songs, um, that's another thing that you that, you you know, I shared with you as it was going on. I ended up uh, doing a transcription with some friends of mine of Eruption yeah. that I worked on for many, many years. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I used to go on Johnny Bean's show and talk about it and, and say, yeah, I'm working with my friends on this. You know, hopefully we can get it out. I realized quickly that there was no way we were ever going to get it published because the you know, securing the rights from the band was so expensive and, you know, they'd never go for it. Right. Right. You know, so I, I went with, you know, after I'd gotten with, with uh, some, some good friends and put it into a really great score, my friend, Matt Sharfglass, who was the transcription editor at guitar world, put the thing into a, uh, a complete standard musical notation score with tab. And he put all of my notations into it. Um, and he wasn't, you know, he's my friend, but he didn't come cheap. I spent right. a lot of my own personal money, like upwards of about $800 to get him to put this into, uh, this format. And he had to work hard for the $800, Right. but I, I wanted to, you know, kind of just, my favorite thing is to dispel the myths 
like you do when you do your lesson videos. You know, it's yeah. like, no, no, it's not played here. It's played up here. Yeah. You know, that's you, you, you comprehend what, you know, why I'm so into it. It's like, I want people to not have to go through what I went through and what right. you went through. And specifically, even with Eruption, it's the most hackneyed song ever. But yes. <laughs> I was led down the primrose path by Steve Vai's god awful transcription in Guitar Player back in 1984. And so was everybody else. And it was like, I wanted to fix that. And I want anybody who gives a shit about actually learning, I don't want them to have to spend 30 years trying to figure it all out. Yeah. Do you, know, you so like, do you like, <laughs> uh, the the lesson on eruption by uh, the LA guy I forget his name right now Pete Pete Thorne yes Pete Thorne yes so yeah I think yeah so Pete the thing with him his video lesson was the first time anyone did a full complete video lesson that attempted to go fairly note for note on the entire piece yeah you know so at that time it was kind of infancy of YouTube in a in a way yeah um and. I loved it. I thought he did a, I thought he put forth a, a great deal of effort and he was closer than some. Yeah. You know, uh, but still he was way off on a ton of stuff. Now my way off and your way off, as we often joke about, you know, it's like you are kind of like close enough. You figure out the rest. Yes. You know, you yes. reach a point where it's close enough and I never, <laughs> ever reach the point of close enough. Right. <laughs> so this is why I've spent 35 years trying to transcribe eruption. Yeah. Literally. So yeah. I've been working on trying to figure out how to play eruption since I was about 11 years old, off and on for all of these years. Right. Mm, and I yeah. really only started getting really down into the, the thick of it with the help of my friend, Bill, who I met on the Metro amp forum. He and I went back and forth on this. Bill's a great, he's a teacher. Uh, he's just a, you know, he's like a junior high teacher, but he's a good, really good guitar player. He turned me on to so much new stuff, you know, so I worked with Bill. Uh, the transcription we did of Eruption was really the, basically his work. And then I kind of went back and forth with him and make, made sure that everything was right and that we had a logic and evidence behind every single note that we put on the page. Yeah. And, um, and then I consulted the guy from Cracking the Code, Troy Grady. Oh, I love that guy. He's wonderful. You know, the guy is head and shoulders the best. There's nobody above him in terms of guitar technique for, you know, for, you know, electric guitar specifically and acoustic. But, you know, his picking, especially the right hand, you know that you've seen his videos. Oh, yeah. So Troy, Troy did some amazing observations. I, I had brought the completed transcription to him and asked him to kind of proofread it for me. <coughs> and he corrected me and Bill on one key lick. And that key lick is the very first repeated lick in eruption. And I've talked about this on our friend Andrew Walton's show on the 5150 show before, but that lick is the, uh, you know, the, uh, yes. Yeah. That lick. Yeah. So as it turns out, that lick is, uh, basically the deal that, and, uh, Troy, got video evidence of this for me and put it in my face and I couldn't, Refuted. I couldn't deny it. Right. He, he completely changed the way I've never seen anyone play the, the lick that way before. And he showed me time after time with specific video of Eddie playing that lick in from the us festival and from the reunion tours. He played that lick, obviously, as you know, in eruption and then in B in uh, I'm the one. I'm the one. Know? Yeah. It's a five note lick. But the key, and again, this is about where you play it and how you play it, whether you use a pull off or whether you uh, hammer on, or if you use a silent hammer on and the right. silent or, you know, hammer on from nowhere. Yeah. That is all up in Eddie's playing. And it's never, that's the part that gets missed from most of the transcribers. Yeah. People don't understand that he, especially when he's playing really fast things, when he's playing his fastest, like say in Panama or parts of eruption, girl gone bad, beat it. Uh, he, so the eruption lick as Troy showed it to me. And, and again, I'm using in my transcriptions, I put the specific fingers, the left hand fingers to use. 
Right. And I have evidence that these are the fingers that Eddie used when he played the licks. Yeah. So it's, it's just index and ring. Yeah. And so that whole lick, the only pick note in there is the open high E. It's an upstroke on the open high E. Nice. Literally everything else is hammer-ons from nowhere, pull-offs, regular hammer-ons, and, you know, that's it. Yeah. So it's just... Yeah. And you play it really fast, and it's really smooth. Yes. And that's why it's so good. Yes. <laughs> yeah, like the the one, the one, when he does it and I'm the one, it's so... It's so smooth. There, there is no uh, dynamic. It's beautiful, and it's it's a five note thing. Yep. And it's uh, it's one of my favorite moments of his. Actually, uh, and so we, what's interesting about that lick too is that so, and I'm the one, and this leads me to what we were we were originally going to be talking about, which is the the you know the use of the MXR effects. Yeah. So one of the things I wanted to make sure I got right in my transcription, because it bothers the crap out of me that just about everybody that tries to play Van Halen on the internet or in a cover band, they kick on the phase 90 and they just leave it on for everything. Yeah. And this That's is insane. not how Eddie did it. No. You know, and so the deal is with eruption, the phase 90 is not kicked on until the G chord in that A, G, D sequence after the whole opening section. Nice. So, you know, it's, it's, so the A chord, no phase 90, right? As he strikes the G chord, that's when he kicks on the phase 90. Right. You, you reckon he forgot in the beginning or no, not at all. I think, because I think he was very judicious about it and he, he's described it in his interviews. It's just a little, it's a little flavor. He uses it to just kind of bring some things out. Right. Yeah. And the funny thing is, is that as I, as I had mentioned to you in, in our, in, in my, in our messenger conversation a while ago, Eddie has this way of the specific way he's playing things. It's his, it's his pick hand. It's whether or not he's using a hammer on or a pull off or a silent hammer on. It's his palm muting. It's yeah. his open strings. It's the way that he articulates the notes can make a series uh, uh, or uh, you know a pattern sound like a phase 90 is on but it's not it's literally just his hands mm. you know so yeah. he can really get almost a phase 90 type combing effect on spanish fly on a nylon string guitar and this is what people are always saying and eddie said it himself it's all in the hands it yeah. is all in the hands and people often would say It's in the hands. I'll never be able to play like Eddie because he's the only one that has those hands. You can learn how Eddie used his hands. So you can, you just don't give up when you hear the phrase, it's in the hands. Right. You then, so for me, I'm like, well, how did he use his hands? I want to know what that means. And what that means is you put all those things in combination, all the articulations. And, you know, it just, it's so much flavor going on with it which is why he's so different from so many of the players he's not a hundred percent legato like holdsworth you know he's not a hundred percent picked like malmstein you know it's like it's just this gumbo everything you can do to you know get some sound and and feel out of the guitar he puts it in and it's just you know the hands on the unplugged guitar and it's there. It's not even to do with the amplifier or the effects, right? Yeah, yeah. So then when he kicks on the phase 90 and it's the subtle vintage phase 90 and you add it on top of those articulations that he's already doing, then it's like, oh, chef's kiss. It's yeah. the, it's the bomb. Yeah. And so like in so say in eruption when he's playing that lick in the beginning, there's no phase 90. So he's just And then, so there's that. And then, but then when you go to I'm the one, he kicks on the phase 90 at the beginning of the second solo to do that lick. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's the deal. So, I mean, it's like, he was so purposeful. You know, people think that he was like an idiot savant that just played random things that he improvised everything. He didn't. He was, he was as, he, as a player, Eddie was like, as much of a repeater of licks 
as Stevie Ray Vaughan was. Yeah. You know, and yeah. it doesn't seem that way because he had a pretty big bag of licks. Yeah. You know, but you and I, when we get down and study it, we know that it's like, hey, yeah, he repeated the same thing the same way every time unless he made a mistake and had to, you know, it, 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 he really was a creature of habit. Yeah. He formulated this shit. He was playing it the same way in 1975 as he did the day he died. Yeah. You know, a particular lick, you know. So, but, and the same goes with the, with the use of the effects, you know, it's like, it's a, it's a spice and he puts it on there like at specific times. So what we were talking about. Let's actually, let's go track by track, starting with the very first track. So I had, I, I, you know, had gotten sick of seeing people doing this and people are just confused (laughs) and, you know, everybody's just like lost in the woods, man. And I'm just like, okay, I'm going to just finally write this down and put it out there and. Like a lot of things, I put some of my observations on VH links. I did that when I finished the eruption transcription. I put it on VH links, and then eventually, about six months later, after Eddie died, um, or actually it was a year later, after Eddie died, we ended up getting uh, the eruption transcription was published in the February 2021 issue of Guitar World, and I told you the whole saga behind that. Yeah, uh, got got really lucky with some friends of mine, and that ended up getting published. So what I like to do is like, I don't care about making money about this. In fact, like I said, I, I spent at least $800 getting the transcription done in the first place. You know, I'm not trying to get views or thumbs up or any, you know, anything at all. <laughs> it's just like, I want to get the knowledge out there, period. Yeah. yeah. I don't give a f- anything about, you, you know, say, money and music is a mystery fun. to me. I have no idea how that works. Yeah. But at any rate, so like, I like to put the stuff out, you know, and VH Links is one of the few Van Halen forums that's kind of still going and, you know, people keep keep re-upping it every year. And uh, so I, I did a, a long post there. And so it was track by track of where and, and exactly when Eddie turns on the uh, MXR Phase 90 and the MXR Flanger on the first album specifically. Cool. cool. <clears throat> so <clears throat> Running With The Devil, track one. I'll quiz you. So do you think there's any Phase 90 on r- Running With The Devil? Well, I've actually seen your uh, sheet and I think, I want to say there's none. Is there none? None. None. And wow. I've had throw down arguments with people about, no, no. <laughs> and, you know, he would he would use the Phase 90 for Running With the Devil sometimes live. You know, yes, like uh, I've I think heard he puts that. it on at the Us Festival. You know, he does yeah. that to cover up because there's no rhythm guitar, you know. Yeah. But not on the record. There's that's, no that's Phase 90 on Running With The Devil, on the first album, period. There's no Phase 90, and there's no Flanger. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So that's first album, and of course that track is is the Destroyer entirely. That's that's the, uh, that's the his 75 Destroyer, same as mine. Uh, and then Eruption. So what I just had told you, the it's when the open G power chord is played at approximately the 18 second mark, and he just leaves the Phase 90 on for the rest of the entire track. Nice. So as the as the uh, the echo from the Univox EC80, uh, the the octave dive at the end is is trailing out. Yeah. You can hear the phase ninety still going on that as it bleeds into "You Really Got Me." Yeah, <clears throat> you really got me. Next track, it's also the destroyer entirely for that whole track. Uh, so only it only comes on at the beginning of the guitar solo, at about one minute and twenty three seconds. After he plays the the D chord, you know, like oh no no, yeah, you know, and then so that that lick right there is right as the guitar solo commences is when the phase ninety comes on, right? Yeah, and then he turns it off at immediately at the end of the solo as as the quiet oohs and ahs start as okay, the cool. bridge. Yeah, so in the breakdown, the phase ninety is turned off, right? Yep. They, he does play that little fill uh, that's kind of leading up into the, uh, you know, into when the band comes back for the the chorus during the quiet part, you know, and he goes, bam, bam, bam. Yeah. No phase 90. Still. Right. There's no phase 90 for the rest of the track. Not even at the end where, you know. That whole thing. No phase 90. Cool. And I, you know, it took me a while. I, I thought it was phase 90 when I was a kid. I didn't know. Yeah. You know, uh, so yeah, so that's it. So that's, you really got me. No, fa- no flanger on the track at all. Ain't talking about love. So here's one where he's using the spices together. He's got the flanger and the phase 90. <clears throat> so as I say, he, he uses it 
uh, to accentuate the little um, the little low note riff that's you know kind of part of the main riff. And the, it's the kind CBT of obvious on the A note, the dare, yeah. Dare. yeah, yeah, that part. Yeah. So he'll he'll kick it on right just for that, and then turns it off. It's just that. Right, right, okay. It's it's a spice, you know? Yeah. So he turns it on just for that. So that, and then, um, uh, and then he, he does this the Hold same on, no. way. Is he, is he turn for the spice? Is he turning on the flanger or is he turning just on the flan- the, it's the flan It's the flanger. I'm okay. sorry if I didn't make it clear. It's the flanger. Okay. So yeah, at this point it's just the flanger. He's kicking on the flanger just for that little low note thing. And he does that. Uh, and I, I kind of used approximate times because people will, you know, you'll, you'll go and look up a, a, a clip on YouTube. The timing may not be exactly the same as the CD. Right. So I'm giving approximates here. But uh, so he does this with this with this little uh, riff on the A string at the three second mark, the seven second mark, the 10 second mark, the 13 second mark, and then the one minute and two second mark. So he doesn't actually use the flanger every single time that he plays that low note riff. Right. Okay. But but a lot of them, but not all of them. Okay. Yeah. So, so Phaser, that's just phasers that. going the whole time. No, no phaser. Oh, this is just flanger. There's no phaser. The phaser is really only used for the guitar solos. Right. Okay. Okay. <coughs> so, and that's the next thing. So the phase 90 is engaged as the G power chord is struck just before the first guitar solo at about the one minute and 22 second mark. And then it's disengaged at the end of the first guitar solo at about the one minute and 39 second mark, right as it ends. Yeah. So as you know, there's a choral electric electric sitar that's overdubbed on both of those solos. Yeah. Okay. There's no phase 90 on the choral electric electric sitar. So, um, but you know, that's again, another example. It's, it's the spice. Yeah. And, if you look on my YouTube channel, I shared this back on classicvanhalen.com a long time ago, but I was able to pull the isolated sitar track from the album and I have I made a clip of it. I'll send you a link if you don't remember it, but Yeah, do that. It's really fun to listen to that isolated choral electric electric sitar. Fantastic. And you see how much how much flavor it adds and clearly that was a Ted Templeman Hey, why don't you get a choral electric sitar and, and overdub that and make it a little fatter, you know, for the right, record, yeah, right? yeah, you know, um, and and it's so good. I, I'm going to share that with you, and, and maybe you can even you know put put a link for it somewhere. But absolutely, th- um, yeah. What I want to know is with the uh, the Echoplex is that is is that been um, dialed a different way because it sounds pretty heavy on that on that uh, on that song. Like there's some sort of delay going on. Yeah, it's a, the that main thing that you hear, and it stays on for the whole song. Yeah, Echoplex is not turned off, um, and it does that slapback echo thing. Um, it might be just a hair, the the the. Uh, I don't know what's the term on a delay pedal because I only use analog delay pedals. Right. All my life, I've never really bought a digital delay, so it, I've. I have, I mean, I have one because I have an even tied H nine, but <clears throat> you know, the, uh, DK, I guess it's the presence or whatever. Oh, the, okay. the, the second note repeat is, is, is basically, it's almost like it's the cathedral setting kind of, oh, okay. Gotcha. You know, yeah. so it's slap back echo, but it's to where that, that first repeat is just as loud as the, the, the fundamental first note that you pick. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Sweet. Okay? Yep. Yeah. And so, there and there's a specific delay time on the echoplex so that's that's one thing the echoplex is on for that entire song uh same with eruption echoplex is on for that entire song yeah um the uh so then back to ain't talking about love so um the then they go back again he goes back to using the flanger during that uh you know that uh, bleed for it the quiet bridge yes you know. yes You know, so he he's turned down the volume knob at that point, and he's just kind of doing. And then he kicks, he he raises the volume just a tad. You know, he's probably yeah. like halfway up on his volume when he's playing those quiet picked arpeggios. Yeah. Um, 
And then he kind of barely turns it up a little bit as he engages the flanger. So that's when he's, if you want it, got to bleed for it, baby. And then he does the harmonics. Yes. So that stuff is well known, but that's the, the flanger has been kicked on at that point and it stays on for that whole thing. And as he goes back into the song, to the chorus, he kicks off the flanger, right? Yeah. yeah. So then, uh, and then again, it's the same thing. The phase 90 for uh, is engaged again just before the second solo comes on at the two minute, 45 minute mark. And then it's turned off at 258, right as he plays the, you know, the... that thing at the end of the second solo. Yeah. So that's turned off. Then, um, right. Uh, he does a little flanger fill. There's a quick, it's really quick. Is it the dive bomb? Fill. Yeah. It's, it's the low E bar dive at, a, at about two fifty nine. Yeah. So he turns it on at two fifty nine and turns it back off the flanger <laughs> at two fifty nine, turns it back off at a, like three at three minutes. Yeah. So it's like one second or less than a second. He kicks it on for that, wow yeah and so wow. that sounds you know super meaty when you do that with the flanger so yeah. and then uh and then all of that is just um he does the same thing at the very very end for that very last uh bar dive at the end of the song you know yeah. you know so he's like and then engage the flanger And he turns off the flanger before he does that last nice thing, right? Yeah. So then, so that's on. A talk about love has a lot of kind of tiptoeing on that. There's, there's, but that's not the worst. Atomic Punk is the worst. That has a bunch of tapping on the the flanger and the phase ninety and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, so I'm the one is the next one. Phase ninety comes on at uh, for the first guitar solo on I'm the one at the one minute nineteen mark. So a lot of people think like the first opening, you know, like the, the riff, right. those quick things or the people think that that has phase 90 on it. It's not the phase 90 doesn't get turned on until the actual first solo. Cool. And that's sort of an example because those fills sound like a phase 90 is on because Eddie is doing all these articulations. It's, yeah. He's he's varying whether he's going to... A lot of people also make the mistake, this is another other topic, but a lot of people make the mistake of just thinking they pick one note and just hammer on the pattern all the way up the neck, and that's not right. how they do it. It's not... That's not what it is. It's... That's trippy. And it's... There's palm muting in there. There's hammer-ons. There's pick notes. It's... He's cha- he he varies whether he picks even on the same notes as he begins another sequence with the same notes, he'll pick it instead of hammering it on like he did at the beginning of the pattern. I mean, right? He's the chef and he's got all this shit going on, and there's no phase ninety, but it sounds like it's a phase ninety because of his fucking hands. Yeah, that's how good this guy was, and yeah. you know he he knew what he was doing. You know, so you know I'm the one. It's turned on for the first guitar solo, turned off at the end of the first solo. So uh, about 119 is when that solo starts. It's over at 137 and it's turned off then. Then it's turned on again only at the phase 90 again, is only turned on at the beginning of the second guitar solo at 2 minutes 33. And then it's turned off again at the end of the solo at 250. Uh, just before he goes, you know, mm. you know, so he's done the... Uh, you know, which, uh, the, uh, yeah. Uh, so when he goes back into the, uh, you know, into the G part after that first, little... yeah, no phase 90 there. He's it's the, the actual leads are the phase 90 and then he turns it off when he goes back into this. Cool. Right. Yeah. So there's, there's that. And then, so, uh, then the phase 90, um, the very, very end when he, when, uh, they do the, you know, the show, you know, the show your, and when he starts tremolo picking that E power chord, yeah, that's when he starts, that's when he kicks on the phase 90. And so the, the ending solo of on the one has the phase 90 on it. Yeah. Cool. Mm-hmm. 
So the phase ninety stays on for the rest of the for the rest of the song there. Cool. Until he hits the So that's I'm the one is is so cool. Because that's the example, you know, that is that is him. He's using his hands, doing all that great stuff, and just judiciously using that phase ninety. There's no flanger uh on uh on I'm the one at all. Saw, <clears throat> then you go to Jamie's oh, what? No, 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 no. Well, I saw a uh, cover band last night called Mean Street. And yeah, I saw play- that. They played that song, and um, the dude. His name, I think his name is Michael Gunthier. Yeah, they did a really, really good job. I always expect. Yeah. I always go in going, you know, <clears throat> yeah, arms are crossed. Okay, yeah. let, let's see how many notes you're gonna fuck up tonight. <clears throat> and this dude, I have, first off, his vibrato was just on fire. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, and he did. They did do some uh, some Hagar stuff, which you know. Ugh, whatever, but um, the the Dave stuff was really, really good. Yeah, I, it was a very enjoyable night. Uh, like, the people that I went with were all like, yeah, that was fucking cool. So hats yeah. off to that dude. And fantastic. You know, my, our buddy, uh, I'm sure you've, you've uh, you know, run into him and maybe maybe talked with him. Simon Hosford, wonderful he, I guy. I think he lives, he lives down the street. If you haven't hooked up with Simon, you got to. He's a, he's a really good guy. Yeah. He is you a know, good guy. Uh, and he he's he cares, you know, about, you know, he he's you know, he he's interested in in the real minutia too, you know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, he he's he's a weirdo like us, you know, really <laughs> way down in the in the depths of of weirdness, you know. Yeah. But, you know, it that's that's not the norm. I mean, I mean, worldwide people don't get it right. No. 99% of the time. I just, you know I, mean? I, I just, I have a mantra and it is the world has a tin ear. Like if you, uh, people don't know, would not know the difference between Angus Young and Guthrie Govan. Like the, and right. that's, just, that's just the way it is. So it's like, okay, well, if that's the case, who, who fucking, who cares? Right. Right. So, yeah. You know. I mean, and we're, we're old dudes and you know, it's like, this is a whole kind of music that is like, you know, it's, I mean, we, it's yeah, we grew up with point. it. Yeah. We grew up yeah. with it and you know, it's, it's close to our heart and yeah. Yada, yada, yada. I mean, but, okay. but so, so then, so the next, and, and there's just a couple more songs left. So Jamie's crying. Um, that's kind of an interesting one. There's not a whole lot in it. That's the main guitar track is done on the Ibanez destroyer and uh, yeah. the phase 90 comes on at the beginning of the pre-chorus, you know, she wants to send him a letter. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's, and he's, you know, he's uh, picking very lightly, just accenting those, those fun little chords that he plays there. Yeah. So that, that comes on at uh, one minute and six seconds and then off at the end of the pre-chorus at one nineteen. That's such a And then good again, song. he does the same thing uh, when the pre-chorus comes back again at two minutes and five seconds. Yep. Uh, and then switches it off right at the end of that pre-chorus at two twenty, And then, um, one thing that I, that I do say, so that's all the phase 90 that I could hear on the entirety of Jamie's crying uh, on the overdubs that were done on the Frankenstein, the little, you know, the melody yeah, with the whammy bar dips and stuff that one, you know, it's got harmony guitars for some, uh, some of that time it's just doubled. And then he does a harmony. Yes. At another point. Like it sounds like there's a, there's one note held and then uh, other notes, there's uh, other descending notes in the background kind of thing. Wee- right. And there's just that like one held note. Yeah. Or and it's, yeah. it sounds like more than what it really is. It's really just two guitars. Yeah. But you know, it's unison on, on the beginning of the melody and then it becomes harmony at the second pass around at it. And then you're, you're dipping with the whammy bar and you know, it sounds really thick because of that. I also think I theorize and I don't know a hundred percent for sure. And this is one of those questions that I'd probably ask Don Landy if he ever shows up on the sunset sound YouTube channel. Yeah. But I think that they may have used a bit of even tied harmonizer just to thicken that part up. Those overdubs on Jamie's crying. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't so doubt I, it. I, it's a theory. I, I don't, I don't have the evidence behind that, but I, I think it might be. I what know for it? a fact that they use the Eventide Harmonizer on uh, Women in Love in the, on the second album and, and right. a couple of other places. But for the first album, my candidate for Eventide Harmonizer use is that overdub on uh, Jamie's Crime. And then <clears throat> you thought this was crazy so far, but we're coming to Atomic Punk. And this is, this is I think you might agree, Atomic Punk is one of the hardest Van Halen songs to play. Um 
in terms of the, especially the solo, the phrasing of the solo is wacky as can be. Yeah. You know, and his sound is so weird. Hard. His sound, he's tweaked. He's done some, he's tweaked with one of those, with one of those pedals and it's, you can hear it. Well, it, you know, the thing is, is that the main thing that's, that it, it's, it's got the rockabilly slapback echo on uh, Atomic Punk, right? Yeah, yes. It's a major part of that. When you listen to him play it live back in, you know, the earlier boots, um, he's got that that slap back going and it, it might as well be scotty moore on that's all right mama i mean right it's the same thing but it 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 sounds really really hyper wacky and that's the tone of the echoplex you know to my mind i believe that's the echoplex that he's using for that slap back echo in there so that's really what gives atomic punk really the freakiness and yeah. then he goes into the secret sauce with the mxr phase 90 and the flanger and so <clears throat> hold on to your hats because this is a lot of crazy shit in this song. So, <laughs> so it's it's the Frankenstein used for the entire song. The song obviously begins, you know, you're doing the the rubbing of the side of the hand near the bridge. I love that. And uh, that's the phase 90. So it's already engaged as the song commences. Okay. okay? Yeah. So you, you do the rubbing thing near the bridge and then it's turned off at about the 18 second mark that's that's after the rubbing intro if you want to call it that yeah uh and then he does the uh there's a fill uh that he does with the flanger as he does the uh, uh back to the rubbing yeah, thing yeah okay um are the, wait are the are, are the phaser and the flanger ever on at the same time no. And so, oh, okay. yeah. And that was the thing that I wanted to get straight because I was a little unclear on uh, Atomic Punk specifically. I, I knew it was never, they were never on together at any other song, but Atomic Punk, I thought there's so much tap dancing going on here. I wonder if he left one on and had them both going, but I listened really, really carefully and no, they're never on at the same time. Right. Never. You know, so he, he's using those, those spices just independently of each, of each other, you know? And that's, yeah. again, that's how judicious he was. He was consciously going, well, I'm going to make it really freaky by clicking on the flanger. Uh, or I'm going to add just a little flavor with this subtle phase 90. Yeah. You know, the, the flanger is, you know, and even that's the thing about the old, the vintage flanger versus the new ones. The new ones are really, the effect is way over pronounced. Yeah. yeah. You know, now, even back then, the flanger, you can tell when the flanger's on. You know, the flanger is a pretty in-your-face kind of effect. But yeah. even that is more, the, the old ones and the chips that they used in the old ones, which are, haven't been manufactured and can't be sourced anymore, that's why the EVH products don't sound like the old vintage Van Halen records. Right. You know, so, but, you know, long story short, that's, you know, the the flanger, you know, like, so he does this fill with the flanger back to the, uh, the rubbing thing uh, as he did in the intro at the 52 second mark. And then he, he disengages it at the 54 second mark. So it's on like roughly two seconds there. And then uh, the freak out right before the guitar solo, he engages the flanger again. And I'm a little unsure as he's going into the solo, whether he's doing the rubbing or if he's just doing yeah, that with his pick. It does sound weird. Yeah, there's, yeah. There's a different sound to it. It's like, meow, 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 meow. yeah, it's true. There's something that's a little more aggressive going on as he leans into the solo, and I think possibly because to me it all sounds like one take. I don't think you know. I just don't think there's any right. you know, chicanery going on there. I think he may have you know done that as he engages the uh, the flanger right before that solo with the pick, so that he could then just dive right into um, the first playing. lick. Yeah, yeah. Is there any footage? Because if you're over here doing this, it's a little harder to get your hand right back into position to go. Right, right. You know, that whole thing. So if he's doing this, you know, the pick is already in place. Yeah. So, you know, that that's 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 another little thing. So he does that right before that solo. Um, now, so this is this is where it gets tricky. So he does that little thing with the flanger as the solo begins, but then also he kicks on the exaggerated slap back during the solo. Okay. Like right before or in the middle somewhere, <laughs> right as the solo begins. Oh, okay. So cool. it's like 
he's turning off the flanger after he does that little rubbing fill. Yeah. And then kicking on the, the, the slap back. Okay, cool. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a little tap dance going on right there. But I think what happens is, so here's, here's how I have it going. And this is just, this is so tough. So he does that little fill at one minute, 28 turns off the flanger at one thirty, and right. So right after he turns off the flanger, I think he kicks on the phase 90 at 131. So within within less than a second of him turning off the flanger, he turns on the phase 90, okay? Yeah. And so I believe that he's doing that and engaging the it's it's like there's three different things. He's turning off the flanger, engaging the echo and then engaging the phase 90 for the solo of Atomic Punk. It's a lot of shit right there in a short space. I'm wondering if he's ever turned on two buttons at once using both feet. Like what you're saying, he's got to turn no, on. No, it's not pedal. not possible because of the way his pedal board was set up. Yeah, um, like, yeah you know, I don't know about that. Yeah, the flanger. So the flanger is way. Uh, in fact, he he unplugged the flanger for a lot of the times. If he wasn't if he wasn't using the flanger in a song, he just unplugged it and went straight from the guitar into the phase ninety. Yeah, right. And then into the front of the amp. You'll see that on the old pedal board pictures. So the flanger is kind of set off of the pedal board. The flanger is not even on some of the, you know, like say you look at the Oakland, uh, the uh, what the day on the green pictures from 78. Yeah. yeah. His pedal board then, the flanger is not even on the pedal board. It's off the pedal board. Whoa. So it's not, yeah, it's not really possible for him to engage. And even if they were right next to each other, it'd be pretty freaking hard to engage both the phase 90 and the flanger together at exactly the same time or that close to each other. So he really is doing some tap dancing. He's having to hit, turn off the flanger, turn on his Echoplex control with the control button and then kicking on the phase 90. So it's like pop, pop, pop. (laughs) Well, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah, yeah. That's just nuts. So, uh, and then, so there's, um, so the Echoplex gets turned off just uh, as it gets to the end of the solo when he does these B chord stabs, the, yeah. And then goes into the rubbing thing with the phase 90 engaged. Yeah. So, you know, so anyways, the phase 90 is turned on at about one minute and 31 seconds. It's left on for the whole solo. Then it's turned off at about one minute and 57 seconds. And then the Echoplex is also disengaged very shortly after that. So he turns off the phase 90, turns off the Echoplex just before those. So when you hear that, there's no echo on the. Right. The echo, the slapback echoes on all the actual leads in the solo, but it's not as he goes back into the song. No echo. Right. Yep. Um, And then. He does the uh, phase ninety again with the rubbing thing, as in the as in the intro at one fifty nine, yeah. then it's disengaged at two oh nine. So that's kind of that break right there is a longer break where he's doing that. Right. So that's between one fifty nine and two oh nine. It's about roughly ten seconds of him doing that, <laughs> and then he does it faster. There's another yes. thing that you may have noticed. You might remember the Kurt Mitchell videos back in the ni- early 90s, late 80s, that guy that did How to Play Like Eddie Van Halen. Yes. So that guy, uh, he was he was really smart, and that guy really was way ahead of his time. He did a full-blown production on How to Play Like Eddie Van Halen. He was the only guy that really tried to tackle it. He was way off on a lot of stuff, but he really was, he was smart about a lot of things. He thought that the, um, the, you know, as he's doing the faster uh, f- rubbing thing, yeah, he thought that that was uh, the the slapback echo. He thought that he was engaging that echo to get the, I guess it's sixteenth notes, right? So he thought that he was just engaged, and so he's, you know, he's going, and then he goes, yeah, like that, right? He thought that that faster thing was done with delay, but it's not. It's just with his hand. And why do we know this? Because there's video footage of him playing Atomic Punk, you know, from Fresno. Yeah. As you well know. So 
so yeah, so that that disproved his theory of the delay on on there. There's other times where he uses delay, like I told you about. I showed you that video of that guy that was so smart to figure out that he was using delay on the uh, on one foot out the door. Remember that? Yes, yes, that was good. Yeah, really good. I that guy blew my mind. I was like, oh shit, that's <laughs> wrong. I was wrong, you know. And so he, yeah, that guy nailed it. So there are instances where Eddie will do that with with Echo to kind of give him that doubling thing like on the women in love intro and all that kind of stuff. And he did it on the crazy fast solo parts and uh, one foot out the door too. Um, <clears throat> so then just to finish off atomic punk. So, um, so he's doing, and this is kind of, this is going to sound really weird and it's hard to follow. You just really have to listen to the record and, and, and just pay attention. But so, uh, after that break, he does the, um, he does the, you know, nobody rules these streets at night but me. Nobody. Wow. The atomic. So the first two parts of that descending part, there's yep. no phase 90. So he's just. Yeah. And then for the extended part of that, that's when he kicks on the phase 90. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's where he kicks that on. So that's at about um, two minutes and forty seven seconds. Uh, so he he does, um, and again he's he goes back to that. But it's the same thing before he goes to the. That thing has no phase ninety. So he turns off the phase ninety before he gets to that, and then. That's so awesome. And then that's it. So there, there's a lot of tap dancing. There's, you know, that, so that was the, that was the, that was the whole thing of Atomic Punk. But man, that like, I get the, I just, I love, I love Atomic Punk. I hate playing it. Right. You know, and you know me, like I'm, I use the vintage Fender Tremolo. I'm a real stickler for that. You know, we used to, we used to joke with each other about that all the time. You know, I, 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 I've got to do it the way he did it. So I, I use the, uh, the vintage Fender tremolo. That shit don't on come Atomic out of Punk, You remember when I was talking about how, um, how Eddie would do the ultra wide bends with the destroyer and he would stay in tune. Yeah. Atomic punk is one of those ones where he does the ultra wide bends with the, with the vibrato bar and he's able to, you know, get it back in tune, you know, before he goes into the, uh, he does all these wide bends and before he does the, the ascending tremolo pick part in the solo of atomic punk, mm. he's perfectly in tune there. So I, I hate that because I really have to really try hard. I can stay in tune perfectly on all the other songs, but atomic punk is a little bit more difficult because he is doing the wide bends that he normally does on the destroyer. He's doing that on, on, uh, on atomic punk. Yeah. yeah so that's a pain in the ass. Then you got all this stuff. You got your Echoplex turning on and off, the damn phase 90 on and off, the flanger. You're doing all three things at the same time, turning one thing off, turning two things on roughly the same time. All that stuff happens. But, you know, Atomic Punk is the kitchen sink. Mm. All the effects that the guy had, he had the Echoplex. I mean, the only effect he didn't use on Atomic Punk, as far as I can tell, is he didn't use the Univox EC80. Now, there's a possibility that he might have used the uh, Univox for the slapback echo f on the solo. Yeah. Possibility. I, I can't confirm that. I have I have two vintage Univox units, and they are analog units, and they sound... I can make the sound of the echo on Atomic Punk with that box, mm. but I can also do it with an Echoplex. Yeah. You know, it, it's just analog tape echo with the, uh, the slapback rockabilly echo, you know? Yeah. So anyway, that, that's, that's Atomic Punk. The, the next songs are easy. So Feel Your Love Tonight. You know, the main track is the, the whole thing is the Destroyer. Yeah. It's got the overdub solo. So the entire main rhythm guitar track, no Phase 90, no Flanger, no MXR effects. Um, then the overdub guitar solo comes in at about 2 minutes and 38 seconds. And uh, the Phase 90 is engaged. Uh, it's left on for the entire guitar solo and turned off at 3.03 at the end of the guitar solo. There's no MXR flanger on the track. That's it. Yeah. That's the only thing. And then here we go again. So here's one that kind of blew my mind when I went back to do this thing. 
this is where I learned something. So I thought that the, that the little dreamer solo had phase 90 on it. I really did. You know, the, uh, he does that little lick. That's almost like the ending solo of ice cream, man. You know, that, you know, his yes. little, you know, yes. You know, his little minor rake. Yes. And then the little pattern, right. Yeah. Which he does everywhere. He does it in take your whiskey home that, you know, all yeah. that. So I thought when he was doing the little repeated lick in there, I thought, oh, he's he might have. I listened carefully. There's zero phase 90 and no flanger, no MXR effects on the entire Little Dreamer track. Yeah, It's bare bones. That's the guitar sound. Boom. Right? So that's Little Dreamer. That was an easy one. <clears throat> so we're getting to the last two songs, Ice Cream Man. So Ice Cream Man... The phase 90 is kicked on when he's doing those sliding uh, major triads. It's like... Yeah. Wait. Do, do, do. Why am I not remembering this? I've played this all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So that whole thing is phase 90. No phase ninety on the rest of the uh, on the rest of the track up to that point, you know, on the electric guitars, right? Yeah. You know the yeah, bare, no MXR, nothing. Okay, so guitar solo, phase ninety, uh, that comes on at about one minute and forty two seconds, stays on for the entire solo, disengaged at two minutes and twenty two seconds at the end of the solo, and then again at the end of the song when they go back into the and he goes into the overdub parts, you know, it's like the Right, do 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 David the bam bam bam. Yeah. Yeah. That stuff has phase 90 on it. Okay. The lead guitar does. But the rhythm guitar, he do, he plays this part the with the phase 90 on, turns off the phase 90 and goes back and plays the Right. So the rhythm track underneath the overdub guitar has no phase 90, but the overdub lead guitar with the call and response thing with Dave has phase 90. Yeah. <coughs> so that's kind of the, that's the whole thing for that. And then um, the, uh, and then he, so he turns off the phase 90 there, you know, he, the overdub call and response thing is over. And then he does, you know, the, that yeah. part, as he goes, the guarantee to satisfy. <clears throat> when he does that part at the end, there's no phase 90 for the. Then he kicks on the phase 90 for. Nice. That whole thing. Yeah. Phase 90 for that. So the phase 90 stays on. Um for the remainder of the track. So he's, you know, he's... so that whole thing is, is the, the phase 90. Now there's interesting side note. So that thing, you probably remember the original, like the official Wolf Marshall, Cherry Lane publishing first official tab book of the first album. That was so, you know, it was right about a lot of things. It was wrong about a lot of things. He came up with this bizarre way to play the Ice Cream Man ending solo. And funny thing about the Ice Cream Man ending solo is that it's literally just follow the dots. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's just hilarious. A pattern how, all the way down. Yeah. And, you know, there, there's times where Eddie does do a visual pattern mm. and there's times where he varies it. It's not you know because he's he's aware of notes that don't sound good when he's doing a pattern. He's yes. not just doing a pattern necessarily. To do the pattern. Just to do a pattern a lot of times. Right. Yeah. Like in On Fire, he's doing some weird shit in On Fire. It's not always exactly the same pattern through all of that stuff, right? Right, yeah. But cool thing about the Ice Cream Man solo, A, it sounds super complicated and super fast, but it's really cool and easy in a way because you are, uh, you're. it's again back to that thing with the eruption lick and the beginning of I'm the One and the beginning of uh, Romeo mm. Delight and the beginning of uh, somebody get me a doctor solo. You're only picking the one note and everything else is hammered on. So it's, yeah. 
See my hand? Watch here. Yeah. So you're doing a silent hammer on to the ninth fret of the B string. You don't have to be Ingve to play that lick and have it sound cool because you're only picking one note. Everything yeah. else is the left hand, you know? Yeah. And it's another and five note sequence. You just continue sequence. that pattern. Another five note. It's another five note sequence. Yeah. So, and you just continue that pattern down the neck. And the whole thing is you're, you're transitioning with the silent hammer on as you go down. And then you, you do the silent hammer on thing down here and your pick hand can already be up here to go back up to the G string at the fifth fret. So it's. So cool thing, you know, it's like, it, it all works out, you know, but anyway, that, that little aside about that, that's one of my favorite things that, that he did. It's so simple and it sounds so badass, and it's so got all the, the phase all, 90. So all those low notes are done on the EA string? <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. And uh, that's kind of an interesting thing about that that part. Yeah. So he's going. So here, I will bring my ring finger to catch that ninth fret to yeah. do the slides down. So. And then as I'm up here on the B on the B note at the second fret, yep. I switch to my middle finger. Yep. And then do the slides up. And the reason I do that is because if my middle finger, my middle finger is on that note and I'm doing all these slides, he does a, you know, he's doing the the bend, you know. So he's doing the he's doing this in a slight bend on the uh, the, the D note at the fifth fret, right? Yeah, yeah. And so your your through. hand is already in position to do the uh, the seventh chord. Yeah. Nice. See. Yes. And that's where we're talking about. It matters where which fingers you use. Yes, a hundred percent. It does. Yeah. Because you can't, if you're doing this, if you're bending normally with your ring finger on this fifth fret, it's very hard to get up to, to make that to make that ending chord. Yeah. But if you've got your, your middle finger, it's already there. Yeah. Your middle finger's on the string that it needs to be on, and it's you just laying your hands up. across. Booyah. You know, you're laying your fingers across. Yeah. <clears throat> so anyway, that's a cool thing on, on Ice Cream Man. So on fire, last song on the record. It's the destroyer for the whole song. It's all live. The uh, so the flanger is used uh, for the fills, and we had talked about this before, a long time ago when we did our little uh, we did our little uh, thing with uh, Derek Van Halen. <laughs> I don't remember him. <laughs> you remember that? No. Well, you remember when it was like me and you and uh, the guy Dave Sampin from L.A. is an actor. Yes. Oh, right. Yes, I remember him. I didn't know he and was that an was actor. The, that was the first time. Yeah, we. that was the first time me and you had done a, a video thing. Yeah, right. You know? Yep. But you, were, you asked me about On Fire. So, <clears throat> um, and I ended up transcribing On Fire. That's the next thing that I'm going to try to get put in, into, a, uh, into a, good tr uh, a good score. Uh, I did. I transcribed that and the live version from '77 from the Pasadena Civic show. Yeah, and it's interesting because the patterns that he plays in the solo on "On Fire" on the record are completely different from what he ended up doing live. After that, he basically played it the same way live all the time, but it's different from what he did on the record. Like notably different. It sounds the same, but it's not. Right. So kind of busy. So anyway, so here's here's so on fire. Your your first fill where it's you know it's like uh, you know. So when you slide up for that first thing, flanger. You kick on the flanger. Nice. So that's it's basically the the fills between the chords in the intro. So first on at four seconds, off again at five seconds because he's just doing that for the that burping. Yeah. And then, uh, and then it turns, it gets turned on again for the. Yeah. 
And that was the thing. He's bending that G string at the 12th fret. And I, I, I don't know if you're, I don't know if you'll agree with this, but I, I know that on that one, he's, let's see. He's doing these crazy wide bends there, man. And again, that's the thing. The yeah. destroyer enables you to do that. You can bend like two and a half steps, three steps. If your freaking guitar is set up right, Yeah. wham, you're back in tune and you can play freaking Bach if you want and you're totally in tune, right? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and that's the deal. That's why Eddie, like, he was he 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 was constrained by the stop tail guitar, but it was also a playground. He was totally free to do these ultra wide bends and not worry about going out of tune as he did with the Fender Tremolo. Yeah. You know, so On Fire is a great example of, of that. I hope people realize just how badass his bending was. I think sometimes it's overlooked by the tapping or the speed picking or whatever, but his bends were fucking out of control. Oh yeah. And his vibrato, the the pitch, his his pitch was just perfect yeah. on his bending. Yes. You know? The, Perfect, and, like, and the, the the triads they never they never wavered. They were always in tune. Like there's that there's a magic touch to that shit, and he had it well, all. Well, that was the thing. It, I know you meant you mentioned that, and and Steve Vai mentioned that. You know, uh, he was talking about running with the devil, and <clears throat> the magic of the of the triads, the major triads, and really all of the guitar sounding so good is the tuning offsets. And that's the thing that I'd studied up a lot. You know, I've, we've talked about that before. So, you know, he he never, well, I'd say never. There's been, he's almost never tuned to straight chromatic pitch on all six strings. He's always using an offset tuning, an alternate tuning, always. Is and that, that's why. Is that by so, his design? I mean, was he purposely doing that? Yes. And so, and and I can refer you to a, I've done a couple videos on it and I've, uh, I've done a really long forum post on VH links about it. Yeah. <clears throat> Here's how, I, and people, a lot of times people argue with me about that. They think, Oh, he was, he never tuned. He just tuned by ear and he's, uh, you know, he's uh, an idiot savant and, you know, or he's an alien that came down and right. you know, he's a God and we have him on this pedestal and he had understandings of tunings that no one, and, no, that's not the case. And the reason why I know that he purposely did it is that I have gone through and found the exact tunings of each individual string on every track on, at this point, almost every album. Right. Well, at least the albums that I care about through 1989, right? Yeah. So, the and, and it, there was a somewhat of a pattern that he kind of used. Basically... You know, Running With The Devil was all bets are off. Running With The Devil had its own particular tuning for that track on the record. Yeah. A lot of people say like, oh, he just flattened the B string so you get that pleasing major third for the... Right, yeah. But that's not what it is. It's actually completely different tunings on the entire six strings of the guitar, such that not only do you get those great major triads sounding wonderful and perfectly in tune, but all of those harmonic runs, you know, the, yes, you know, all that stuff, those things sound wonderfully in tune because of the tuning that he chose. Yeah. And I know he chose it because he didn't, you know, there, there's a lot of things that people just think that he did like spur of the moment or it was accidental or, oh, he was drunk or he was high or all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> the guy did uh, so much on purpose. You know, it takes away from him to just say that he's a god or he's an alien or he's right. something, he's inhuman. Yeah. You know, it, that that's 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 like giving him short shrift. Yes. That's basically like saying like he wasn't that smart. Right. You know, but he was that smart. You know, and Eddie wasn't the only guy that used uh tuning offsets. <clears throat> Jimmy Page, Dwayne Allman, Robin Trower, uh Leslie West, a lot of the great guitar players that are out there that you can name have used them. And I, I can tell you that I don't know. I've, I've have, there is one video that I have of Eddie inside the 5150 studio uh, during the uh, rehearsals for the 2007 reunion 
where he's tuning for running with the devil just by ear. He doesn't have his Peterson tuner in sight there. Right. right. That's where he's running through it with Wolfgang uh, in the studio. But I watched how he tuned. So they're running through all the a bunch of different songs that, 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 that they're, they're going to want to play. Right. Mm. When they get to running with the devil, he specifically takes time and tunes and he's trying different notes across the fingerboard and he's tuning so that this matches this and this matches that yeah by ear wow for that yeah so when people say he just flattened his b string that's not it okay yeah so i've gone in and actually measured with the peterson tuner peterson strobe tuner the exact pitch down to within uh one one hundredth of a cent or a cent yep and so I've, I've recorded all of the different tuning offsets that he used. Running with the Devil was really a wacky one. I mean, it's designed just to play that one song. If you use the tuning on Running with the Devil for any other song on the first album, it sounds like total ass. Right. Right? Yeah. Like the high E string is pitched way down. Right? Yep. Incidentally, none of the songs on the first album are tuned down a half step. Are they lower or higher? It varies. It's yeah, always right. somewhere in between. Yeah. Generally speaking, they are, they're going to be somewhere above the exact half step down. Okay. Mm. So it'll be like plus 30, 30 cents plus nine cents from the, the zero point of the exact chromatic pitch. Yeah. Of half step down. Yeah. Right. He didn't, he, he did this on the first three albums where he didn't tune anywhere near the exact chromatic pitch on fair warning. He started on a couple of the most, a lot of those songs he's tuning almost to exact chromatic pitch, but fair warning is the album where he comes in with the even tied harmonizer heavy on everything. Yes. So that harmonizer disguises those kind of weird things. Mm. right mm -hmm. so that's he he does now he goes back to there's other times where he goes back to using those same 1984 there's a bunch of weird alternate tunings on there you know like girl gone bad girl gone bad you know people people always say like oh roth never sang and you know they had to tune down a half step for roth right. well 1984 has songs that are in standard pitch yeah absolutely they do you know jump you know Girl Gone Bad is actually about almost 30 cents above standard pitch. Yes. And it is not because of tape speed manipulation. That guy tuned that guitar to that pitch. Hmm. And the reason why I know this is that all strings would have to be pitched up to an even degree. Right? Mm -hmm. But he's using a tuning offset because each string is out of tune with the chromatic note to different degrees. You know, it's not like all six strings are exactly 10 cents above pitch. Right. When you use tape speed manipulation, everything is all together advancing in pitch at the same rate. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So that, that's another thing that people would attribute it to. They'd say, oh, they, they, they did something with the tape. They sped up the tape. They slowed down the tape. No. <clears throat> you know, not, not with Van Halen. They, they, they totally didn't do that, you know? Yeah. So let me, let me, I'll just put a nail in this and finish. So on fire, he's doing that, you know, the climb up the G string is the flanger. Uh, and then he turns it off before he does the. Uh, right. Yeah. Which I, I remember it was our friend. You remember uh, our friend Dimitri Douglas, alias yeah. Jimmy, and some numbers on yes. a lot of forums. Yes. Jimmy was the guy that taught me how to do the on-fire break perfectly. And I know you struggled with that, too. Yeah, and I wanted him to do it. He, yeah, he had a little video in there and, and everything. I, I never got it right until he showed me how to do it. And it was like, oh, God, that's it. Mm. Right? Yeah. And then again... <clears throat> He, you know, he uses a tuning offset on On Fire. So even those little harmonic breaks sound extra badass because of the way Eddie tuned the guitar, right? Yeah, yeah. So, but anyway, so he, he, he turned off the flanger to do the break. 
And then he, he again, the flanger is a spice. He, he does it just for the fills. The, he turns on the flanger for the fill at about 34 seconds, turns it off at about 36 seconds. Then the phase 90 comes on for the guitar solo at about one minute and 30 seconds. And then it's turned off at one minute and 40 after the little uh, trill at the very end of the solo. The... Right. Right after that, he turns off the phase 90. And then the flanger comes on again for the fill at two minutes and three seconds. And then it's turned off at uh, two minutes and five seconds just before he hits the A fifth power chord uh, at the very end of the song. So that's it. <coughs> but that gives you an idea. Again, it's like it's not it's this guy didn't do things on accident. You know, no. he wasn't just mashing buttons and, you know, he, he he was purposeful with what he did. And it. And again, it's like, um, I don't blame people for not having figured this stuff out because, you know, I, I wasn't, pl- I played in bands off and on for like decades, you know, but, you know, Steve Vai didn't have 35 years of sitting in his room working on Eruption alone for months, years, right? When Steve Vai did that first transcription of Eruption in 1984, he literally was doing it on the bus or backstage in a green room while he was playing with Frank Zappa. Right. You know, he didn't have a slowdown software. He had a cassette machine that he was able to slow down, but it, it the pitch would slow down. Right. Yep. Yeah, gotcha. So, you know, when Steve did his transcription, he he and he also was doing it on a deadline. So the guy's a guitar player asked him to transcribe Eruption and he had about, I think he had about two weeks to complete that project and he didn't even have a guitar with him. And I know this because he said this in, in, in several interviews after Eddie died. Right. <clears throat> he did not have a guitar with him. He listened to the song and just wrote it down in musical notation on staff paper. That's crazy. Imagine never, how hard that is. Oh, that would be insane. Like how 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 good or bad is the transcription? Oh, it's god awful horrible. I mean, he's yeah, he's he misses so 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 much. And well, I yeah, I mean yeah. I mean and I and again, I I don't blame him. Right. If if I was doing this shit backstage with an old effed up cassette recorder, yeah. You that know, would be hard that, as the, fuck. Yes, and no guitar. Yeah. That's crazy. No guitar. So, of course, you know, so the main thing, the most obvious thing is that he, uh, you know, there's a couple, there's a bunch of obvious screw ups in that one. And again, this was, you know, many people tried to transcribe Eruption. There was about three or four attempts done officially in magazines and in transcription books over the decades. (coughs) You know, and then some of them got some things right, some didn't, you know, but none of them got everything right, you know, until really I me and my friends work so hard on getting every single scrape and note transcribed correctly. But Steve did the tapping part on the G string. <laughs> so he started it on the G string. Right. That's so it's wacky. not. And you know, that is a rookie mistake, right? You know, yeah. people now know and because, and again, there was no video. No, you know, um, we all know for a fact that he plays the whole tapping section of Eruption on the B string because we see him do it in Live Without a Net. Yeah. We know he does the trills down the G string. Yeah. And then he reaches over and then... He starts going nuts. Yeah. Yeah. But so that was one of the things that Steve missed. Steve also had transcribed the tremolo picking part as having taken place on the B, on the G, the B, and the E string. What was it? Oh, right. Yeah. <clears throat> it was wacky. And then, we, but we, but what we have the benefit, we have the benefit of the video. We right. watched live without a net and we know that there's no sliding going on in the tremolo picking section. And he does it all on the high E string. Yeah. He does the hummingbird thing. Doesn't move his hand at all. It just stays right there trilling. And he's just... And so that's the thing that if a lot of people do, I'll see people will slide up because they don't want to do the stretch. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't like to do the stretch, so I slide. I know. 
but it's one of those things where if you practice it enough, it's second nature and it's, it's actually easier to do it that way than to have to worry about sliding. Because when you're sliding, you're having to hit a target pitch. Right. When you're, when you're doing the spread, your fingers are already there. Yeah. You know, that's one of those things, but you know, I don't blame Steve, you know, no, how could I, you know, but that was all we had to go on back then. And so, yeah. you know, I started off learning eruption and Spanish fly from Steve's transcriptions back in 1984. And it messed me up because it was so wrong. Um, how bad is, how bad is the, um, uh, Spanish fly? Uh, it's real bad <laughs> there. I mean, but now Spanish fly is one that is Spanish fly is, is I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say that Spanish fly is, is probably maybe the one Van Halen song that I don't think can ever actually be played as exactly as it was played on the record by anyone ever again. Yeah. And the reason being, that was something that I went with my, with my friend, Troy Grady. So Troy Grady, he analyzed, you know, the picking patterns and slows down, puts it in, you know, your, your, uh, your, your DAW workstation has a graphic representation where he can show where, where he misses Spanish flies loaded with so many fret farts and mistakes and, and accidentally hit muted notes and just fuck ups. Yeah. And there's no, um, there's no picking pattern that he sticks to. It, it's right. all wacky, especially like, you know, the, uh, that, that whole climbing, uh, the, the, the sixths, the sixes, the climbing yeah. sixes. Yeah. He is not just hammering that on. You know, he's not going. He's not. I thought at first that he was picking all six. Yeah. I thought he was just picking all six and doing it really, really fast. Right? Right. It turns out that after Troy and I, Troy, you know, showed it all to me, he is just like, I mean, he he is... He's really going for it, and it sounds so good on the record. But there's so many mistakes that are so random that even that, even after all I went through with me and my friends on on Eruption, I don't think we'll ever be able to get, you know, we might, Troy could probably actually dissect Spanish Fly and get all the mistakes put in. Yeah. But being able to physically play the mistakes and the purposeful notes exactly as they were played on the record is yeah. impossible. And I, I never like to use that word impossible because I really believe that anybody, if a human being played it, I believe that anybody can learn how to play it. Right. You know, because I don't believe in gods and monsters and aliens and all that kind of crap. <laughs> There's human beings. And if a human being played the damn thing, it can be played yeah. really. Yeah. But Spanish fly. And, and you can tell that. And again, like, he, he did probably two or three takes of that, and he just went with the one that sounded good. That's how he did Eruption, supposedly, although Brian Kehue says that there was only one take of Eruption that he ever found in, in the tapes. Right. <clears throat> but, you know, Spanish Fly, as he kind of famously, I think what he says at the beginning of Spanish Fly is he's saying, like, and again, or I can do that again. Oh, you know, is that what he's saying? Yeah. I, he's like, yeah, and again. Yeah. I can hear okay. the word again. Okay. So, you know, so I think he went through, did a take, was dissatisfied with it, then went for another take immediately. Yeah. And so, but that's the deal. And of course, he's he's tuned, Spanish Fly is amazing because obviously he's tuned down a whole step. He's tuned down to, and again, it's not, it's it's a weird, wacky tuning offset for that one. Yeah. It's roughly down a whole step to D, but it's not. It's a wacky, really weird uh, tuning. <clears throat> and then you're on the the nylon string ovation. I I actually and this is another thing. I went and bought a late seventies nylon string ovation. Was the last guitar that I bought several couple of years ago. But I bought that specifically so I could work on Spanish Fly and Little Guitars because he used that on Little Guitars and Spanish Fly, right? Yeah. And it has no cutaway, so it's a bitch to play you know, the, the high parts up here where you're doing the A minor arpeggios and stuff 
the, the climbing sixes. Right. And you know that the 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 uh, cl- the ovation classicals and most really all real classicals join the body at the twelfth fret. <laughs> yeah. So if you're trying, you're 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 way. I could go get my ovation and demonstrate it, but it's like, <clears throat> yeah, it's hard to do what he was doing. So you know, it, it's a it's a clumsy guitar for him, but he he gives himself a little wiggle room by tuning so far down, and it's a solo piece, so he doesn't have to worry about the band being in tune with him. He doesn't have to worry about the bass. No, you know, so he's tuned all the way down, you know, roughly to D and then he's, he's just going for it. So the kind of that, his, his great picking and, uh, and the mistakes that he makes, the guy's loaded with mistakes on Spanish fly, but in the end it comes out sounding so great and so aggressive Yeah, and wonderful. But you yeah. know, that, that's, that's my, uh, that's kind of my white whale. You know, eruption wasn't the deal. I I worked so hard with my friends to to try to get eruption transcribed and and luckily published, um, because it's it's the it's the hackneyed one, it's the famous one, it's the one that everybody always talks about, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, it was the thing that that introduced him as like, okay, this guy is different. This is this guy's doing something that's never been done before, right? Mm. <clears throat> but Spanish fly is like, that's the one where it's like, I, I don't, I don't think in, I don't think in my lifetime I'll ever be able to figure out how to play it. All I can do with Spanish fly is try to put myself in his mindset and try to come up with the way that I think he might have meant to play it. Mm. See, I'm trying to figure out in between all the mistakes what was he trying to do? What was he trying to execute and failed to execute? You know, so I come up with a way of, of having a repeatable way of playing that tune. Has anyone, you know, has you, anyone taught it on, uh, on YouTube? A bunch of people have, have taught it. Uh, there's a guy named Rick Graham. Who, I've seen him. I've seen Rick play it, but does he teach it? Yeah, I think he yeah, does. Right. Yeah. I think he actually does a lesson on it. Cool. But Trust me, every lesson you're going to find out there is completely wrong because yeah. nobody has nobody realizes the mistakes. But that gives nobody me realizes hope. every I'm, I'm, blanket statement. No one comes close. Yeah, but that's not cool. Rick Graham. I love nobody. It. I love it. It's but it's the, the white whale. Nobody will be able to do it. Uh, you know, yeah. unless Troy Grady, and he won't do this. But if Troy wanted to sit there and and, and transcribe it using you know his software and his ears and his knowledge of picking and he could probably transcribe it but no one would ever be able to play and execute that piece yeah. the way that Eddie originally did it yeah. it's impossible yeah it's maddening but that's why you that's why you just put it out there and do a lesson because no one's ever going to get it right so it doesn't hurt to just throw your shit out there anyways you know and See, i that, think that's that gives yeah, me hope people, well, the thing is, is that people, people, and that's the thing that kind of annoys me in a way though, because people, this is why I, I think I connected with you way back in the day is that you never once go, this is how it was played. And I know this and I just know it. And so the way I'm showing you is the right way and no one will be ever able to correct me on this. Yeah. That's not, that's not the Doug Steele method. You know, that is not how that goes. You're like, here's how I think it is. I don't know. Maybe, you know, anybody out there got something, throw it at me. I want to learn. Yeah. You know, cause you want to really learn how it's done, but you're not going to, I, and and me too. I want to always leave the door open that I'm not, getting it right. Troy showed me stuff that I never could have figured out on my own. I don't think my did friend. You go to, Bill did you go to his house? Stuff. Did you go to Troy's house? No, 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 no. This oh, is just, all done. Was... This is all through online. Yeah. Like on his forum. Yeah. You know, uh, I'd private messaged him my, uh, the, the eruption transcription and he was kind enough to look it over. He had uh, another person from his team, look it over, but Troy was the guy that really gave me the, the insights. Nice. And, so luckily, and then luckily in, in the magazine, I was able to, you know, they, the, uh, the, uh, transcription editor, Jimmy Brown for guitar world, he, he let me, you know, he used some of my words in, in the article that accompanies the transcription. And I was able to shout out, uh, my friend Bill, who was the, really the, the, the catalyst for the whole thing. 
who did, you know, at least as much, if not more work than I did in a lot of ways. Uh, and then Troy Grady, who helped me with that first lick on, uh, you know, the beginning of eruption that, yes, that thing. Yeah. And then, uh, also my friend, Mark Bonta, you may have seen his videos on, uh, YouTube. He goes by Van Bonta, B O N T A. And he has a bunch of replicas that he's made. And he actually has a microphone and he'll sit there and sing the background vocals as he's playing through the tracks. <laughs> no, I gotta, I gotta see that guy. So, re, so send me a thing. Send me a thing so I, I will, can put it I down will. below as well. You, you've seen his videos before. I think you'll recognize him because he, he, he's, uh, he's not posted in a long time. He's, you know, he, but he did like, he built a lot of replicas back, you know, back way back in the day. Nice. So Mark helped me, me and Mark went back and forth on the Univox EC80 Echo dive at the end of eruption. Yeah. So Eddie had always said in that he thought, you know, Eddie, Eddie claimed that he put a different motor in his Univox EC80 echo chamber. And that's how he was able to do the growling dive octave dive at the end of eruption. Yeah. But we found through trial and error and, and using different components over about three months uh, with our vintage machine. So I had two of them and Mark had two of them. They're rickety old pieces of shit. <laughs> and, you know, Eddie had two of them in the practice bomb. Right. One of which was never plugged in. The other one was a backup because they always fuck up. They're right. terrible quality machines. Wow. It's And they function off of a little tiny uh, mini eight track cassette. Okay. And getting that eight track cassette to sit at the with the insides and the heads contacting it just right. Right. It's a bitch. It's just so Eddie would buy a bunch of these things and then just throw them away because they really couldn't be fixed. Jeez. And he'd just get more. And so he only used the Univox in 78 for the end of eruption and then never again. I think he just was like, Well, these things are 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 bullshit. I'm not ever yeah. screwing with these. You know, so, but Mark and I went back and forth and we tried different components. And what we, what we figured out was that the only way you could get a complete full octave dive that was easily repeatable was to use a 25K pot on the echo delay knob on the unit. Right. So, and this was after trying a bunch of different pots, bunch of different values. Um, you know, so you... You know, you hit the harmonic at the end, you engage the the echo, and it's a it's a slap back echo. Just you know, you turn up the uh, you turn up one of the knobs that causes the note to oscillate, right? And then you bring it down with the echo delay knob, and when you do that, it causes the pitch dive, right? And if you have a twenty five k pot on the echo delay uh, part of the Univox unit it will dive very smoothly and very easily all the way down to that octave. Nice. If you use any other kind of pot, the stock pot doesn't work. Right. And any other value doesn't work. And it was three months of going back and forth in our spare time, trying to figure out how he did this. And Mark uh, was the one that, that hit on it. And, you know, we would make clips back and forth with each other. And when he did that one, he'd be like, how does this sound? And I'm like, that's it. Don't change a thing. That's the one. So we put that in my transcription. So at the very end of the transcription, and again, it's in the February 2021 guitar world, there's specific instructions on how to do the dive and how to modify your Univox to put the 25K pot in it. You know, so we give you step by step, like, okay, play the harmonic at the 12th fret, hit the, uh, <laughs> hit the engage the button with your foot. Turn up the button, the knob to get it oscillating. Then turn down the other knob to get the dive oh, at the end of the track. Shit. And so then it, and then it just trails off into infinity. And then you can actually, with the Univox, you can you can fade the oscillation, just like it is on the record. Oh. So, <clears throat> in fact, I've actually done the. Uh, I'm able to play the end of eruption exactly like it is on the record and leading into you really got me because once the note is oscillating you can unplug your guitar switch right. guitars yeah. while it's oscillating do the dive didn't he do that isn't there footage of him doing that well yes. that's exactly how he did it yes yeah 
But on the record, he didn't do it that way because You Really Got right. Me was a standalone track and then Eruption was the very last thing recorded for the album. Yeah. And then when Ted decided to put it on the record, he and the band, I guess, came to a consensus and thought that Eruption or the, just the guitar solo that was known at that time would be a good lead in for You Really Got Me, which was going to be the obvious first single. And that was the thing that you know got everybody excited and that was their breakthrough. So when you listen to Brian Kehue's uh, track with the studio mics, because he has just the room mics and he played that on the Sunset Sound YouTube channel, you can hear the uh, the fade out of the oscillation and then you hear Eddie turning off the echo unit and then on his Frankenstein still, he starts going. And they did that so that they would know how to time it to blend the other track in. Mm. So You Really Got Me was one of the, I think You Really Got Me was actually the first thing that was recorded for the record. Yes, probably. So about a month later, Eruption was the last thing recorded for the record, wow. right? Mm. So, and that was what I got from Brian was that, you know, they were doing that so that they had a way to cut the tape to splice in the original recording of You Really Got Me. So it, it created that, perfect medley that we all know right yeah so that's just an example of my craziness and you've known me for so many years and you've always <laughs> been kind and you've stuck up for me when everybody else is trying to just fuck nail me to the cross all these years yeah you've been a good friend and i appreciate Cheers. it so much Cheers, dude and you're you're you know I've, I've seen your lessons i've seen what you what you can do my hat is off to you, man. You're an excellent player and you are yourself. You can't help but being yourself. That's true. Thank you. And there's no other way to be. And on a side note, I'm going to say, hey, I am so proud of you and rooting for you that you have gotten on the wagon, man. Mm. It's a big deal and it's worth celebrating. And I, I've said that to you privately before, but you know, I'm here to say it right now. It, it's <laughs> awesome. Thank you. It's an awesome thing. It's never I, too late. No, I actually, I wished I had done it sooner. Yeah. I just wished I had done it sooner. But I got to tell you, I had so much fun getting drunk. Oh, my God. I know. You said that. And, you know, hey, I, I can relate. It's fun. It's not like I've never, you know, uh, never partied or anything. But, you know, like mm -hmm. my thing, and as I said to you privately, it's all I can do to play. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I, I can't impede myself. And I know that I would watch my friends who would smoke pot and drink and they would go on stage oh. and play like ass. And in their minds, they <laughs> thought they were God on Mount Olympus. They thought they were playing great. They were out of tune and couldn't fucking play for shit. Yeah. So I was the one guy that was sober that was in <laughs> tune and could yeah. play. Yeah. And so it was like, I realized pretty quickly that it's like, Hey, you know, there's, I don't know how Eddie did it. I don't know how these guys did it high and drunk and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's yeah. like, I, I can't, I, I can't, I'm, mm. I'm, I'm feeble enough as it is. I don't need to put some else, you know, to disable me further, <laughs> you know? <clears throat> so, I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't know if you agree about this and it's like, and it's, you know, it's a whole other topic, but you know, I feel like that when people are sober, you know, they're just more in touch with the reality of what they're doing on, on an instrument. You know, yeah. And I would hazard a guess that you're a much better player when you're sober. I, I think I might be. Um, I, but I also want to, I want to give a disclaimer. I was, well, actually that's not true because I'd been hammered many time on stage, but usually I'd have a two, two drinks to kind of get the edge off and then maybe have a, another two during the set. And then afterward, absolutely get myself maggoted. Um, yeah, it's just, I'm 53 now. I like, I have to go to the gym so that I can continue to play live music. So I don't, you know, kill myself. Yeah. But, um, just being sober. It, um, it's just, it's just, it's just really a better way to be like, okay. If somebody called me at one in the morning on a Saturday night and they go, you got to come get me. It's like, well, yeah, I can, because I can get in my car and drive. You know, there's no, there's no issue there. Uh, the amount of money I've saved, uh, the, bet, the the way I feel now, yeah, it's it's just something I really wish I had done maybe twenty years earlier. And it's not like, you know, every like Brandon Ellis, who I love on guitar, he's he doesn't drink beer anyway, and I don't think he was a really hardcore drinker anyways. He doesn't drink. Jeff Loomis, another guy, he doesn't drink. 
uh, or stopped drinking. Um, Wes Houck, who's a, he's a burning guitar player. He stopped drinking. Like all these people that are, you know, they, they've stopped drinking. It's no longer a part of their lives. Nita Strauss, she doesn't drink anymore. So yeah, it's just, um, I think, I don't know. My personally, I was just ready. That's it. There was, yeah. I, I didn't, I wasn't driving drunk or anything stupid. Yeah. Or I didn't punch somebody in the face because they gave me the wrong change or, or anything like that. It was just like, wow, I'm 53. And, and you know, hangovers really, really hurt. And um, mm. maybe I should stop. And, yeah. that was, and that's it. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a crusader either. You know, it's like, uh, and, you know, I'll, you know, I, you know, I, I'm not a tea. I mean, yeah. I will have a margarita every once in a while, you know, but I've never been, you know, I've never been a heavy drinker. You know, I, I've seen that was the whole thing. You know, it's like and I had a different story. Like I told you in the beginning, hmm. I lost my uncle who died at 23, you know, drunk driving, you know, and it was like he didn't hit anybody else. Thank God. But, you know, he he died. Yeah. You know, and it yeah. set my life on a totally different trajectory that I never could have imagined. You know, I mean, like I, I would never I met my wife when I was playing at a club. Nice. You know, I like I the kids, my wife and my kids that I have. I have because I was a guitar player, you know, and all that stuff got put into motion from his record collection and from him, from me getting his instruments and his amps when he died so young, you know. Um, was he your mother's and, brother or your father's brother? My father's brothers. My father's brother, he had, my my dad has two sisters yeah. and his brother was the youngest. Yeah. You know, so my dad was about, um, I think my dad was about nine, nine or 10 years older than him. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, you know, that, that, that changes things, you know, um, yeah. and you may know this, I, I talked about it with, uh, with Andrew before, but, you know, I was lucky enough to meet Stevie Ray Vaughan about a month before he passed away. Wow. And, um, you know, he's a guy, obviously he's well known that he got sober, you know, and he was a guy where I couldn't believe how he was able to play. Cause he was, he was really messed up for a lot of his life, you know? Mm. Um, and my, uh, my uncles on my mother's side, my uncles on my, my mother's side went to, went to high school with Jimmy Vaughn and Stevie Ray Vaughn, um, at various times in the Dallas Fort Worth area. Right. <clears throat> and, you know, they were really poor kids. You know, their father was an asbestos worker. He was the guy that would like spray asbestos wow. everywhere. Yeah. You know, and you know, they were, they were some really, you know, they're, they did okay, but it was like, they, they were actually really poor, poor kids. Yeah. And they had a kind of a hard scrabble life and, you know, their, you know, his, his dad drank and just like Eddie's parent, you know, Eddie's dad, Alex and Eddie drink. And, you know, it's like, there could have been a lot of good stuff that came out of Eddie Van Halen if he wasn't so fucked up all the time. Yeah. You know, I, I think that there would have been some detente between him and the singers possibly, or, he would have just gone off happily and done something else. I don't know, you know, but yeah. there's a lot of stuff that goes wrong. And I, I just witnessed people who cleaned up and I, you know, I saw Stevie Ray Vaughn go from, cause I, I saw Stevie Ray play six times. First time I saw him was in 1985. And then I saw him six times after that. And the last yeah. time was on June 13th, 1990, three days after my 18th birthday. That's when I met him. I spent about 45 minutes with him. And, you know, like a lot of people that do AA, he was a total evangelist for it. And he was, you know, but he was, he was right. also cool. He knew that people weren't going to listen to him. He was just doing what he was supposed to do in the program. And he knows, he knew that people, if they were ready, they were ready. And if they weren't, they weren't. Yeah. There were, there's not a whole lot you can do. It's like, you have to decide if you're ready. Yeah. You know, but you know, he ended up having like a much better life and much better relationship you know, we, he ended. He had a great girlfriend that I met who was uh, who's from New Zealand, actually. Jana Lapidus was his girlfriend, and she was sitting next to me at the show, <clears throat> and she was backstage. You know, when when we were hanging out, and you know, he had this beautiful model girlfriend, and he was getting ready to get married. He was happy. He really had. He didn't. He loved his brother so much, but it was like Jimmy had left and started playing across he was touring when he was like 16 or 17 years old he left high school and just left yeah right and stevie was about five years younger than him so he was like in junior high you know just barely getting out of junior high and and stevie and and jimmy was already a legend right yeah 
And, you know, so he actually, after he got sober, other people in the band started getting sober and like, and then Jimmy Vaughn got sober and they did that record together and they like really reconnected as sober individuals, you know, and they became much closer together yeah. um, as a result of that, you know, you know, and then, you know, but I, my whole thing is like with, with, it's like, I can't play, I can't do the two things that I really like to do, you know, or did before I had children. And that is, I can't play the guitar for shit when I'm wrecked and I can't fuck when I'm wrecked. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it was like, why, you know, why am I going to shoot myself? In the, you know, a yeah. woman's going to get naked with me and is consented to have sex with me. Why am I going to get myself so damn drunk that I can't get it up? I mean, what, you know, right. Yeah. It's I a no it. brainer for me. I'm not going to drink. I don't need to ruin yeah. my chances at playing or having sex. So it's, there you yeah. go, kids. That's your PSA. <laughs> don't drink. Uh, look, we should probably uh, cut it off, but listen, before let's do we, it. Well, Thank you so much, dude. And we will definitely do this again in the future. Absolutely, man. With Van Halen too? We'll, we'll run through that? Yeah, that'd be fun. All right, good. All right, dude, take care. All right, buddy. Cool. And now I'm going to stop it, but don't leave. <laughs> <laughs>